Well, we are in the book of John. If you haven't been here, uh, grab a Bible. There's some in the chairs. There's some at the Welcome Center. Feel free to use an iPhone, iPad, whatever you've got. Uh, version is a good version of the Bible apps. Uh, if you're looking for something to, to look the Bible up on your phone or your, your electronic device. But we're going to be in John 4 today, moving into John chapter 4. And, and this sermon is kind of going to be split over two weeks. And, and you'll, you'll understand uh, as we go through it how, how that's going to work out. But we're going to be uh, in John chapter 4, and we're going to be in the first 26 verses. And I'm going to read those to you, and it's quite a bit, but that's okay. It's a, a good, good story. And, and we're going to be looking at these verses. And our story today, John is, is going to show us how intimately God is with us through Jesus. Um, Jesus, who, who came down and, and dwelt among us, right? But we're going to see today where Jesus is, is really going to get in there where the dirt of life really is. He gets in there where, where the brokenness is, where the fallen world really is, where, where it's you know, down in the muck and mire of life. And, and this, is, of course, is one of the main points that John makes throughout this book of John that we're learning from, is that Jesus dwelt among us and, and connected with us, and it was intentionally part of who we are, and uh, we can be relationally connected to Him through that. And as I worked through this this week, one of the things I was thinking about is I honestly, uh, honestly believe that one of the reasons that we struggle to comprehend grace is because we've not really dwelled upon this idea of Jesus down in the grime with us. Uh, we place Jesus on a pedestal rightly, but Jesus took himself off of that pedestal and came and was a servant and walked among us and did the things that we do in life and experienced what we did. And, and if we think about it in, in, in that way, it helps us to comprehend the depths of his love for us. So today we get this kind of front row seat of the, the radical grace that's being poured out into a truly unexpected place at an unexpected time into an unexpected person. And, and that comes again in John 4, 1 through 26. Now I'm going to read those for you. And oftentimes you'll see, I don't read directly out of my Bible to you. The reason for that is, I can put it on here with a size 22 font, and it's a whole lot easier for me to read than it is in a size 8 font in my Bible. But do know, whenever I'm reading off of this, it is the Word of God. You'll see it on the screen here as well. So John 4, follow along and read with me. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Verse 5, So he came to the town of Samaria, or came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, so noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and this well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his son and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying you have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one that you are now with is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I have perceived that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming 
when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and it is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I, who speak to you, am he. Now just to highlight a few things out of the story for you. Jesus is at Jacob's well in the story. Jacob's well is, is, is a, a, a huge thing in this story. A huge thing in the story of God's people. If you know your Old Testament well, um, oftentimes God is referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And Jacob's well is a pretty significant moment and place in the storyline of the Jews. Um, it's in this general area where Abraham made his first sacrifice to God. Lots of interesting things happen where this well, or in this general vicinity of this well, is located. Uh, it's also in this area that, that God first gives his promise of land to his people. So a very significant place. And not only that, there's some other huge moments that take place right around this well. Like, like Abraham's servant, uh, he meets Rebecca here, who would eventually become Isaac's future wife, right? And then Jacob meets his future wife, Rachel, here. And Moses meets Zipporah here, who becomes his wife, right? Now if you're single, you're going, Pastor, where is this well? <laughs> Right? Just some GPS coordinates or something? Uh, asking for a friend? What? But uh, there, there were some pretty stunning outpourings of, of God's sovereign grace here. And Jesus has just shown up, and he basically says, Who cares about this water? I have the living water. And he's doing, of course, what he's done all along. He's saying... These other things, like this well, they require you to do this over and over and over again. If you want to drink, you've got to keep coming back, you've got to keep coming back, you've got to keep coming back, right? Over and over and over again. But what I want to do, Jesus says, I'm going to do once and for all. My sacrifice is complete. The, the, the purity I bring to you and impute in you is complete. No penance. I am your Savior. Living water is found in me. Fullness of life is found in me. That's the argument that Jesus is making here. And here's what's, what's stunning if, if you're reading this. She wants this, right? I mean, this is an easy conversion if you're reading the story. Look at verse 15. The woman said, Sir, give me the water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water again, right? I mean, that's huge, right? I have the living water. Who wants this living water? And she's like, where do I get the living water? Give it to me, right? I mean, at that point, it's like, play the song. Let's do the altar call. Let's get her book written down in the name of life. Come on down, right? That's, you know, everybody comes running down for the prices, right? That's kind of what you expect. And at that point, you expect her to get her to sign on the dotted line. Convert her, right? But then what happens? Jesus goes to a place that's, frankly, shocking that he would go to. If you didn't know the text, and I said, guess where Jesus is going to go next, right? You're probably not guessing he's going the direction that he goes. And I think you could probably talk about these next verses, these next five verses, in fact, as what I would call the wound and the worry. Let's pick it up in verse 16. She's now said, I'm ready for this living water. Give it to me. And Jesus says to her, go call your husband, right? And then come here. Woman answers him, well, I have no husband. Jesus says to her, yeah, you're right. You have no husband. You've had five husbands, right? Now you're with a dude, not your husband. What you've said is true. 
This conversation just got really awkward, didn't it? Give me the living water. Okay. Do you want the living water? I do. Give me the living water. Okay, go grab your husband. I don't have one. Yeah, you're right. You're with the sixth guy who's not your husband. Now, there isn't a, uh, a lot of information on the backstory here, actually, other than we can tell this is irregular, of course. Let me tell you what we don't know. We don't know if she's been widowed five different times, which would explain why, honestly, the sixth guy is like, nah. <laughs> Nature of our relationship is going to have to be a little bit different, honey. I mean, seriously, I don't care how good looking she is. If there's five dead dudes in her past who said I do, I tell you what, not even as a pastor am I saying I do. I can do that math, right? We, we don't know what, right? But there's a backstory here. Maybe she was an adulterer. We don't know. But there's something going on. Something about her coming to the well at noon. Which is not when you go to the well in the heat of the middle of the day. That's not when you normally went to the well. You went to the well earlier in the day. You avoided the sun. You went there where all the other ladies were there and you could go and have a conversation with them, right? And share and talk and, and be in community. She's the only one coming at this time of the day. She's trying to avoid some people. There's some kind of shame going on in her life that she's hiding. So she's going to the well at noon, not wanting to talk. And certainly wondering, why am I talking to this guy, right? That's not something that happens. And as she's talking with him, in fact, she's going to try some misdirection here in a second. But you can't really misdirect Jesus. You see, he's not willing to accept from her some kind of easy believism that, that doesn't get to the root of her hurt. In a, in a broken or fallen world, all of us, every single one of us, we all have at one level or another been wounded. And we've learned to self-protect. Sometimes that wound, it came from our own stupid decisions, right? Sometimes our wounds came from somebody else's stupid decisions. Sometimes it, it happens just because the world is broken with sin and with death. But when we operate out of a wound, and when we learn to self-protect, it's hard for us to walk in this living water that births forth into eternal life. Here's a thought of the day. To be 99% known is to still yet be unknown. Let me talk about how that plays itself out. If you have this little 1%, one, one tiny little percent, right? That, that, that maybe it's just one skeleton in your closet, right? Just that one thing that you don't like to talk about. Just that 1% that nobody knows about, right? That 1% that causes shame of some kind, right? It's something that's happened in your past. Maybe it's a, a present struggle, something that you're holding on to, something, though, that you're hiding. And even if it's just 1% of who you are, it keeps you from being fully known. What happens when you are 99% known is that you are unable to fully receive love. You're unable to receive anyone's affection or words for life. Because anyone... Anytime they try to, to, to tell you something, try to love on you, try to share the joy with you, you can easily go, well, if they just knew about this, right? If they knew I actually... this. If they, if they really knew me, right? And you've convinced yourself that if people were to know that 1% or maybe it's 4% or maybe it's 10% but if people were to know whatever that is then their view of you their, their respect for you their love for you their capacity to be gracious to you would evaporate in seconds so now what you do 
is you begin to defend and hide this 1% with all of the willpower that you can muster. Because to bring this out, you fear would be your death. It's death because you're protecting a wound. Here's the difference between a wound and a scar. Right? If you've ever been wounded, you know the difference. You got a big wound, and somebody comes up and starts poking it, you're going to punch them in the face, right? Knock it off! That hurts! Quit! But if it's a scar, you're like, hey, check this out, cool scar. Right? You ever seen like old war buddies? They're like, hey, look at this one, look at this one. Trying to show off their, their, their wounds. Are their scars, not their wounds? A wound still hurts. So you protect it and you defend it. Jesus loves this woman too much to allow the wound to fester any longer. He's not being cruel to her by bringing the subject up. And it's a, a picture of what Jesus is after even today. When he says, woman, you want streams of living water to burst forth from your soul? Do you, do you want joy? Do you want life? You want it to spill up into eternal life. Go grab your husband. Well, I don't have a husband. You're right. And I know this hurts. You've had five, and the one you're with now, not your husband, is it? I get it. And I want you to know, Jesus is saying, that I'm here for that. It's an epic tragedy that the place that Jesus wants to do his most significant work in us is the place that you and I spend so much time trying to hide. And it's crushing for people. For Christian people, people in church, people out of the church. And there's this spot that Jesus wants to get in there. He wants to heal. He wants to put it back together. He wants to make us right so that we can experience streams of living water bursting forth into eternal life. But when Jesus says to us, go get your husband, we hide. We don't want to talk about that. He's exposing a wound and we don't like to address a wound. And she's not only going to try to avoid this altogether, but she actually tries to self-defend with doctrine, if you read the story. She's trying to defend herself, her wound, with theology. Look at what happens next in the story. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that Jerusalem is a place where we ought to worship. So she's deflecting, right? She's changing the subject and trying to go somewhere else with the story. He says, go get your husband. And she's like, oh, I see you're a prophet. Right? I don't want to talk about that. I see you're a prophet. Great. Hey, hey, since you're a prophet, you, you guys, you know, Jewish prophets, you say, we, we should worship in Jerusalem. But my people say we should worship on the mountain. It's a misdirection, right? Yet her worry is a worry that still exists today. Her worry is, is this true or is that true? Which is true. It's a legitimate worry. And Jesus certainly isn't going to just uh, brush it off to the side. But he's after her heart. He's after her wound. And so she throws up kind of this hotly debated theological schism of her time, trying to distract. And Jesus answers her without losing his big picture focus. So which is true is her question. And Jesus is going to answer her like this. Look at verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Truth does matter. And Jesus doesn't shy away from the truth here. He gives her the truth as it's understood in the Old Testament. And he just laid it out. Hey, we worship what we know. You worship what you have is only a, a vague notion of it because salvation is from the Jews. Now look at 23 because the whole thing, he, he steps in here and fulfills it. There's, there's, there's nothing better than that, or there is something better, sorry, there's something better than that, that mountain. There's something 
better than Jerusalem. There's something better that is coming. And not only is it coming, but it's here. And he says, but the hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know the Messiah is coming, He who is called the Christ. And when He comes, He will tell us all things. This is a beautiful moment in our story. She's trying to defend her wound. She throws out this theological debate. Jesus lays out what is true. It's from the Jews out. And then he transitions into the good news of the gospel for her life and for ours. But a time is coming. But no, not only is it coming, but that time is now, right? When the true worshipers won't worship on this mountain. When the true worshipers won't be like the Samaritans here. They're not going to be like in Jerusalem, like the Jews, but instead the true worshipers will be the ones who are the kind of worshipers that the Father is seeking. And the irony of that sentence right there in that moment, the Father is seeking, will worship Him in spirit and in truth. He's turning back away from, I hear your theological maneuvering, trying to keep me away from your wound. But that's a distraction. We don't really need to worry about that. Because I'm here. And because I'm here, true worshipers are going to worship me. Not your mountain or on your mountain. Not in Jerusalem. Not at the temple. But in spirit and in truth. And I think the, the most stunning part of the story, the apex of this whole text, verse 26, she's trapped now. What do you do now? She's been trying to dodge with doctrine, right? And Jesus steps in and basically says, well, doctrine's awesome, it's necessary, but ultimately, it's all about me. So what she do? She tries one last Hail Mary. I'm not talking the Catholic kind, the football kind, right? And she says, well, 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 we really can't know, right? One day Christ will be here. When Christ is here, we'll know all these things, Right? And here's what's mind-blowing. Here's where our brains should almost, you know, short-circuit. In a gospel, in the gospel of John, that's full of I am statements, right? I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, right? All the I am statements that Jesus gives through the book of John. In this book, the very first I am statement is given not to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, who was a, a leader of the religious people of Israel, a man of power and of influence. It's not given to any of Jesus' disciples. He doesn't give his disciples the first I am statement. No, it's given to this Samaritan woman of questionable history. Jesus answers her question. Look at verse 26. And Jesus said to her, I am who you speak of. I who speak to you am He. And, and this statement should make it incontestable that Jesus' living water is indeed a free gift, completely independent of gender or nationality or merit. And, and listen to this. It's completely independent. This free gift that Jesus gives of grace is completely independent of one's past or one's present. Did you hear me? The free gift of God's grace is not tied to our person's past or present. This woman has repented of nothing yet, right? We'll get to that next week, in fact. But this week, the free offer of living water went to whom? To this woman. Five husbands. Now she's with the six dudes, not her husband. This woman, stuck in her sins, rotting on the inside with shame, is met with grace from a man who was part of a people group that had been oppressing her people, 
a, a people group who hated her people, who slandered her people, who attacked her people. In fact, the Jews prayed that salvation wouldn't be given to the Samaritans. They hated the Samaritans. They were not friends. And yet, here it is. The grace of God is lavished upon a Samaritan woman with a disreputable past in history. Oftentimes, I think, you and I, if we're Christians, we have kind of in our minds this, this image, this picture of what Christianity is, right? That there's never any dirt on it. That it's just beautiful, right? How many of you have seen the Lego movie? Yeah, a lot of us kind of think of like that Lego movie song. Everything is awesome, right? If you haven't seen the movie, that song will get stuck in your head for at least a month, just as a warning. It's a great song. But it's kind of like that. Our, our, our intellectual idea of Christianity, like everything's going great, right? Like everything's awesome, man. I'm doing great. Man, I wish you could have been there this morning for my quiet time. I, I think it was Gabriel. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure an angel showed up, right? I think an angel showed up this morning while I was praying. And, and I wasn't even afraid like those chumps in the Bible. It was like, hey, what's up, Gabe? And I gave this angel a high five while I was praying to Jesus this morning during my devotions, right? You guys do that this morning? Did Gabriel show up at your prayer time? No, because that's not reality, right? It's not my reality, I can assure you of that. And if you look in the Bible, it's filled with broken screw-ups. Men and women who made all kinds of mistakes and all kinds of failures. People who weren't mature, slow, slow learners, and people who didn't listen to God. And that should be encouraging to us, right? That should help all of us. Because they get the living water before they ever get it. Right? And God just won't back off His lavish grace on them. Study the life of David, right? If you study the life of David, I, I promise you will learn that God is right there in the mix with all of the blood and all of the failures and all of the falls and all of the brokenness and all of the foolishness and all of the stupidity. Right there. Holding together, working through, encouraging, calling back into repentance and confession, pleading to lay down that 1% that we are hiding so that we might receive streams of living water and that they might burst forth from us into eternal life. Because you see, you don't get cleaned up. You don't get looking good. You don't get all your problems solved and then find Jesus. That's not how it works. He finds you in your darkest mess. But He doesn't want just part of you. He doesn't want even just most of you. In the Gospel of John, he's been deconstructing every bit of that nonsense. And he's replacing it with the freedom that is found in the saving work of Jesus Christ. He who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. You see, Jesus didn't save you to leave you where you are. He saved you, and He will, through the highs and the lows of your life, shape and mold you. Because His steadfast love is unbreakable and sealed in you with His promise. Not your promise to Him. His promise to you. And did you hear that? It's not your promise to Him. It's His promise to you. Here's what I know. Some of us, maybe many of us, we've been, we've been hiding some stuff. We've been holding on to some stuff. And it's holding us back. It's keeping you from living fully in the freedom that Christ intends for you. Maybe it's just one percent. Maybe it's just 1% that you're holding back. But for a lot of us, it's a whole lot more than just 1%. And we're afraid what people might think. We're worried that it might change our relationships. But what if that change is for the better? What if living fully in Christ 
and in the freedom that He bought for you on the cross is greater than what you have now. You see, Jesus is offering you streams of living water to cleanse you, to free you. So what will you do? He's offering you grace, forgiveness. When Jesus presses on that wound, you can find forgiveness. Don't let that little bit that you've been hiding back, that you've been holding back, don't let that that 1% or whatever it is hold you back from knowing fully the grace and freedom, freedom found in Christ. And if you don't have that 1%, if you've set it all free, awesome. But that means there's probably some people here today that you need to love, that you need to listen to, you need to lean into life with them and not judge them as they share their mess. God is knitting us together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as a a family of faith. Granted, it can be an awkward family, lots of crazy uncles, that's okay. Because God uses our imperfections. He uses our brokenness and our gifts and our abilities to do something beautiful as we commit to fully be together with one another. As He works His Word out through our lives and as we are transparent and loving with one another, God does amazing things. You can see in this story where through the wound that mercy and grace is coming to this woman. And it was through that hidden one percent through the shame that the grace of God was going to take root. We'll watch the story unfold a little bit more next week. But my invitation to you is the invitation of Jesus. Go grab your husband. Whatever it is, that that one percent, whatever it is that you've been hiding, where you need healing, go grab it. So that streams of living water might burst forth forth in you for eternal life. Let's pray. So God, I thank you for these men and women. And God, I know many of us are in different places in this process. And I love, God, that this story is a process. And God, as we're going to see next week, we know we can see the beauty of the invitation and the beauty of the streams of living water that burst forth in this woman's soul transforming everything, leading her to the fullest life possible. And God, I would pray on this day that you would awaken our souls, awaken us to your goodness, awaken men and women out of their slumber, out of their hiding, that you might grant them by your Spirit's power the courage to say in a safe place that you've created for them, here's my 1%. I'm tired of carrying it. I'm tired of hiding it. I'm tired of burying it. God, you don't want 99% of us. You want all of us. I don't want any more secrets in our lives. We are imperfect. We are broken. But Jesus loves us anyhow. And I don't want to pretend anymore. God, do that work here. God, this message is so perfect for a communion Sunday as we are reminded of the depths of your great love. God, as we come to the communion table in a moment, it's a reminder of the sacrifice you made on our behalf. That while we were yet sinners, you died for us. We didn't even know we had a need. Yet you went to the cross, taking our guilt, our shame, Dying for that 1% we've been working so hard to hide, Lord. We went to the cross for all of it. Whatever darkness we've been hiding. So God, on this Communion Sunday, I just pray that whatever that baggage is, whatever those things we've been hiding, those skeletons in our closet, that we would become true with them. And that as we open up about that, that you would 
Give us freedom in that. Lord God, we come before you as sinners in need of a Savior, every single one of us in need of your grace. And God, we thank you for that mercy and for your love that only you could provide for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. We love you and praise you in your beautiful name. Amen.